Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Decided Brain, where we believe you should love whoever the fuck you want to love and be whoever the fuck you want to be. My name's Chris. My name's Sam. I'm Stacy. And I'm Grace. And I hope I summed that up pretty well. Is that right, mm-hmm. ladies? I, what I wanted to do there was I wanted to go full Lin-Manuel Miranda on you and be like, love is love is love is love is and just stop, you know, never stop. Love is 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 love I love it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was literally his acceptance speech for, uh, I think, what, the Tony he got for. Was it really? Yeah. That's so cool. He was like, love is love. And he just kept going until like, it got him off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. I respect that man so much. Oh, I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about some LBGTQ, was it AI plus stuff? IA plus. We have we just IA keep plus. adding letters to the lexicon because, All you know, right. this is this is where I, you know, I, I feel like um, words are important. Right. Mm-hmm. And labels can be restrictive, but labels are also, you know, how we know where things are and my dad so we all talk we all know i talk about daddy right mm-hmm. um my dad is is an attorney and uh he's always kind of fought the good fight for members of the lgbtq community awesome. before it was uh just lgbt it was just gay and lesbian um and so i remember him calling me one day when some more letters were added and he was like all right well what do these represent because i want to make sure i get it right (laughs) and i I love that about him that he you know he deeply cares enough about people and very much believes that humans are just humans and we should all deserve to be you know loved and respected for who we are so exactly all all of the things we are you know it's just kind of coming under you know a blanket umbrella of how people want to identify and language you know i know sam is a linguist and loves words for the sake of words and how they function and you know queer is one of those words that was a slur and then has been reclaimed and is now an empowering thing to identify as queer just means that you're not falling into the mainstream and i kind of love that you know i I don't care how many letters we want to add to this i want people to be happy just be happy love love who you love Exactly. And I I can't agree more with that. Um, But in case you guys are just now listening in on us, this is our month of acceptance. We've uh, talked about um, uh, women. Uh, We had like a week of badass women. We have had a week of uh, talking about uh, rate uh, race. And this week we're going to be doing LGBTQIA. Um, And we're uh, and obviously Grace is really excited to do about this. We're also very excited to do this one, too. Um, but uh, let's get to get into what we're drinking. Yeah, I, I didn't change it up uh, during the break, so I'm still drinking my founders. <laughs> 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 but I'm almost done, and it's 11. percent So you can see my uh, my cheeks are getting a little cheer, like you know a little rosy right now. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm down to half a cookie. And Orange Cat, I'm, he's probably gonna lick it because he's like right here. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get DJ OC, if you get some random music, you know why. Says hi. <laughs> For sure. All right. Well, I, I did change it up. I actually chugged the last one because usually we do an hour episode. I'm used to drinking for one per hour as opposed to one per 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, sign up, chugging that one and got a uh, Mat- Magner's Irish Cider. Um, usually it is brewed like it's brewed fresh over in Ireland, but this one is actually brewed over in Vermont. So it's not quite as good as if you were to have it over in the uh, Isle- British Isles over there, but it's still pretty decent. That sounds lovely. Oh, yeah. Nice and crisp. Uh, Liz actually loves this one because, uh, I don't know, it's just her favorite one when she was visiting over in, uh, in uh, Ireland and England. And it's just so hard to find over here. So it's quite the commodity. Nice. Well, awesome. I have I have left my tea and I am back to my uh, circle. I <laughs> Alex uh, now has his own. He loves mine so much and I don't want his nasty... Uh, almost eight-year-old germs all over my water bottle so i bought him his own aka snot (laughs) yeah no just gross kids are gross so i I bought him his own but that's what i'm doing i've got my got my happy little circle and we're trying to hydrate awesome i uh i've actually been really good about water during the whole sickness so i'm proud of myself oh yeah so is so is our habitica (laughs) happy for it too I'm uh, still drinking what I was drinking last time. I've got my water and I've got my Coke Zero, but I'm trying to lean more towards water and hydrate appropriately today for the first time in many days. Look at us being like adulty. 
<laughs> I know it's weird. Yeah, and I'm still back in college, just drinking Wait, my life is away. It, is it? Does it take like me getting sick and then Stacy having all of us having a shit crazy insane week? Like, <laughs> yeah, we're all just trying to recover and like get our bodies <laughs> and minds into a good place, and so yes. water. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. and my, I, I'm like, you know, this is gonna be probably the last beer for a hot minute because I'm like, I can't even like it. Ta- honestly, it only the only reason it tastes pretty good is because I still feel like you know, like my senses are a little dumbed down because <laughs> this is a really strong beer. And I'm like, ah, eh, it tastes fine. <laughs> it tastes like fudge. <laughs> What's the percentage on that? Eleven. <laughs> Ooh, damn. damn. I know it only takes one. <laughs> All right. So, Grace, you want to get us started off? Uh, sure. So I've been nominated to, uh, I guess, kind of lead this one, which is weird because it's usually Sam and Chris and or <laughs> Stacy, but not not usually. I'm just real mouthy. Um, but <laughs> so but this since is I, the perfect one for you, right? Well, like this- I mean, so since since I am the the out and proud member of the LGBTQIA plus crowd here, I, I guess it kind of makes sense. Sure. Um, so I want to, I want to start I feel, off with. Can I can I say Grace like on a personal level, this fits well for you because we know I'm bisexual, but I, I'm relatively quiet about it just because of the nature of my relationships have always been with men. So like I haven't been purposely quiet about it. it. Just generally doesn't come up in conversation. So I just I'm kind of a private person. So I don't believe it or not outside of this podcast. <laughs> Whatever you get, you get. <laughs> but like generally speaking, I'm pretty private and don't really talk about it unless it comes up and it just generally doesn't come up in conversation but you are i love it out and proud and i just have always loved this part of you that like you know you're you're always fighting the good fight for this well and i the funny thing is i you know i mentioned that my dad has always kind of been uh, a trailblazer himself and then when i came out uh, when i was in high school um dad's was like you know i don't really care as long as you're happy as long as you're happy i don't care who you date or what you do but i've Uh had really great examples of you know, what this looks like as far as um, being active in your community. So before I came to Florida, I sat on the Human Rights Commission for my hometown. And, back, you know, my my whole town, my hometown in West Virginia uh, was still a little bit behind the times, as many places in West Virginia are. And my dad had helped to author legislation for his town that he was currently residing in, uh, in the panhandle of West Virginia. And... I helped to rewrite our ordinance for our city to include sexual orientation as far as non-discrimination and housing and employment and, you know, kind of yelled at the mayor of my hometown at one point and dared him to say it to my face instead of in a, you know, general, <laughs> general collective. Fuck yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. So I got pretty involved back there um, and have stayed involved in a lot of ways because I do feel that it's important to have that policy in place to be able to say this is not what we do and have those protections. Because as as you've talked about, Sam, you know, policy is where it is and you have to change it there. You have to be willing to do it. But I, I and remember it does start as something as simple as just pronouns. It really I mean, honestly, does even in a legislative like the importance yeah. of changing language in a policy is is. I cannot even tell you how important that is. And I know your mm-hmm. your dad would probably get on, on this wagon too. Yeah. But it's a big deal. Yeah. So so I remember when we had the first meeting, it was in a, in November and in West Virginia in November, it's cold and it was balls cold. And our city hall is not very big. You know, the, the meeting room is not very large at all. And there was a massive turnout because they were going to have the first reading of this, this legislation and, and you know, get community feedback and response or whatever. And uh, when all of us got there, the doors were supposed to have opened at 630. All of us got there at six o'clock and it had already been packed by the local churches. There was no room for any of us to come in. They had all signed up to speak. Nobody Mm -hmm. had a voice. Nobody had a right. And uh, when they came out of this meeting, they were singing, we shall overcome. And I was just fucking infuriated. I was infuriated that nobody's voice was allowed to be heard. The only person who was in that room that was an advocate was a woman named Gail Kenzie. And Gail was just um, tirelessly advocating. She had a, a gay son. And that was the moment that the fire was personally lit for me was, what do you mean we shall overcome? Like we're, we're here, like we're your neighbors, we're your fam- we're your friends, we're your families. I've probably helped start some of your all's loved ones hearts beating again, because I was a medic at that point in time. And, 
you know, you love me then. You love me when I'm holding your your dying mom's hand on the way to dialysis. But tonight you're sitting here outside of this this town council meeting and you're screaming a song from a hymn in my face because I'm wrong. And it was a huge thing. And it's not ever been something that I've forgotten. And, and so this is a, a big thing for me. Right. And this has been going on for years. So, you know, Sam, I, I know that you had mentioned, you know, kind of the Stonewall riots and what that looked like. And yeah, I know a lot of people know what the Stonewall riots were. And a lot of people may or may not. Um, and it was basically in Greenwich Village where the queer district was, where the gay district was. Um, it was one of the few safe places that you could go in that area in Greenwich Village. And um, there was a an unofficial law at that point in time um, the that stated that you had to have on three articles of clothing if you were up in public. So they had masquerade laws back in the uh, early 1900s up through the 1920s that kind of governed like what could be considered masquerade dress. And if you weren't at a masquerade party, because you know, people have gone dressed in drag right. from one side or the other forever. Right. And it, it's fun and it's entertainment. But if you were going to one of these bars, you had to have on three articles of clothing that are were clothing of your assigned gender in order hmm. to be able to be in public. So if you were a lesbian and you were out dancing with other women and you had on shirt and pants and not a skirt or, you know, high heels or, or whatever that was, you could potentially be arrested. And they utilized this um, in June of uh, June 28th of 1969, where the police department went out there and just started arresting people for this it it was unbelievable and it kind of shifted the way that everything happened people started to become really aggressive with no longer being willing and it's it's ironic because in a lot of ways this does intersect it was the black drag community that really helped to pull a lot of these things into being you know for a long time uh gay rights and black rights were entangled together and it didn't really split honestly until white people figured out it was going to be more advantageous to try to fight the quote gay fight on their own because everything was still so bitter from the civil rights movement so that kind of leads to one of the people that i really wanted to talk about you know the the stonewall riots were the the dynamite but this fire has been burning for years years and years and years and if you look at gay history and how we change things um there is a blues singer i don't know if you guys have ever heard of her her name is uh gladys bentley and i don't know if you want to pull it up sam but she came to new york out of her hometown in pennsylvania during the harlem renaissance so that was in the 1920s when Harlem itself was going through a massive stage of entertainment and just ideas. And the, the black community there was extremely strong. And she got out there and she, again, prohibition was in full swing at this point. Right. So she arrives there when all the white folks were flocking to Harlem because that would be where you could still find the booze. Also, during Prohibition, the gay scene and the mafia were kind of uneasy bedfellows because you've got the gay people who are outside of the law and the mob who are outside of the law. And so the mafia often supplied the gay bars with alcohol. Like they didn't necessarily like each other, but it was a symbiotic business business. relationship. Yeah, it was a symbiotic relationship that worked really, really well. So um, Gladys Bentley uh, came into Harlem performing in Midtown Manhattan and she was just absolutely a woman who did everything on her own terms 100% of the time. She performed wearing men's clothing, a tux with tails, a bow tie, a top hat, very short, what we would now consider more of a butch hairstyle. And she huh. scandalized the entire community. Absolutely. Respect. was. She was just graphic and body and 
absolutely entertaining for everybody. She even went so far in an interview as to tell people that she'd gotten married. And uh, the interviewer asked her who the lucky man was. And she said, I didn't marry a man. I married a woman back in the <laughs> 1920s and then dared anybody to say anything to her. So she is kind of that intersection of the LGBTQ plus our people of color plus, you know, revolutionizing an entire bar scene. So she was extremely important in that in that era. However, when prohibition ended and people started leaving Harlem as, you know, an entertainment district and went back to their own areas, she stopped performing in the same way. She didn't have the same area and ended up moving out to California where she did a complete 180, married a man, two men, although one of them denies that they were ever actually married, but continued her singing career. And there are photos of her as being the quintessential housewife wearing like a white frilly dress later on. Oh, there it is. I am a woman again. Yep. Where she had articles that she was a piece of that said, you know, okay. So she was just thinking incorrectly during her younger, wilder days in Harlem and now has wow. changed her life around entirely and um, got treatment that showed her that it was okay for her to be a woman. But there's a lot of speculation that it was never about that, that it was just the performance, that she still continued to live her life very quietly the way that she wanted to and just did what she needed to do, just not not quite as flamboyantly. But she started to pave the way for other people. Um, so Stonewall Riot and that area came after Gladys. So there was a huge amount of black drag queens, far more so than white drag queens in that era. Um, and after Stonewall, the black community gave us, the black gay community gave us a lot of things like, uh, you know, disco and house our house music was, you know, kind of pioneered by black DJs in the 1970s and early 80s, which is how we've gotten to, you know, this wonderful house music and techno that we, some of us listen to. Uh, my kid, for one, loves it. <laughs> <laughs> it's atrocious sometimes. Um, and all of these things also help to create uh, a book that if you haven't read and you have an interest in reading about um, kind of what this was like for the LGBTQ community, especially during that era. Um, it is a book called Stone Butch Blues, and it's by an author named Leslie Feinberg. And it chronicles Leslie's search for finding out who they were. Um, Leslie Feinberg often passed as a straight man. For many, many years in many areas, very much a butch woman um, kind of helped to pioneer transgender acceptance. And Stone's Butch Blues was published, I want to say, hang on and I can tell you, um, but 1993 is when Stone Butch Blues was published. And it was about her life and what it was like for her to attempt to find who she was. Um, later on, she kind of worked with pronouns and I keep saying she, because depending on which space she was in or she, because, or they, uh, would utilize any of the pronouns that other people felt comfortable with, because she said that she had come into her own and had learned how to live in her own skin and didn't care what you used because the pronouns were important, but they were less important than coming to this person with decency and respect. Uh, and interestingly enough, Leslie Feinberg was also like a pretty uh, heavy duty communist and very much advocated for workers' rights, along with the rights of transgender people and really just. Can we just point out that because this has happened frequently in the last what th uh, three or four things we've talked about, uh, like we right, is that if you've noticed the kind of overlap each other. 
know, you have the abolitionist movement overlaps the women's suffrage movement. It's it, it, this is no accident is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Like it's civil like rights dom- movement. It's like dominoes at, just falling over. Right. There. Like it's it, because there's there's overlap. And, you know, you're talking about uh, civil rights literally happening at the same, you know, and you're getting dragged at the same time in the 60s. I mean, like it's and the women's movement. Right. Like you're getting the women's right movement in the 60s as well. So, like, there's no surprise. This is all happening. It's just. No. Yeah, so Outer king. yeah, no, I mean, so Feinberg actually described herself as an anti-racist, white, working class, secular, Jewish, transgender, lesbian, female, revolutionary communist. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that that was almost, how, so, almost sounds like Daenerys Targaryen's title, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right. Really. And, and very much did like it. So Stonebutch Blues is fictional. You know, it, it is not an autobiography. It's it's not an autobiography, but it does very closely like follow a lot of the events that happened in Leslie's life and how they came to be where they are and what it was like to fit into this very uh, blue collar working class community as a butch lesbian um, who then later identified as maybe more masculine than (laughs) lesbian. Um, And then they also wrote a book called Transgender Warriors. And the tie in for this here is that uh, Leslie Feinberg is one of the inaugural 50 people on the memorial for the Stonewall riots. So as a pioneer and trailblazer for the LGBTQ community. So if you ever have a moment and want to, you know, see, you know, get a a really phenomenal look at what that time period was like for people, not just because it, you know, being transgender, being more in the, the LGBT community had a lot of friends that were there as well. So it talks about what they went through. DJOC is back. <laughs> he says he gave you an applause, so he did. Thanks, OC. <laughs> Love OC. But yeah, it's it's a phenomenal book, and it's one of those that I have recommended over the years for people who want to learn more about what that was like. So, um, I definitely think that that was kind of a neat this, way. This this she want us talking about her makes me so much want to talk about what's happening because there's like. A billion things that are happening right now in trans oh, yeah. land um, just across the United States. The one I, I actually didn't even know was happening. I'm going to bring it up now is the uh, it, it was, I think was in 20. No, this just came out. Yeah, this article is just in February that Tennessee State Senate voted in favor of a bill that criminalizes adult cabaret performances. Just going after drag like as a as an entity is in itself kind of funny not not funny funny hashtag funny not funny to me and kind of hypocritical too because there's been so many movies that you've seen where men dress up as women to you know have some sort of goofy premise um victor like victoria what? mrs doubtfire uh to white wong chicks. fu thanks for everything love julie newmar white chicks yeah. yeah. I mean, Patrick Swayze and John Leguizamo and Wesley Snipes, the entire premise of that movie is that they're drag queens in the 90s that end up in this tiny little town during the Strawberry Festival. You can't tell I've seen that one once or twice, can you? Um, (laughs) But but now, did you see the one that's being passed uh, or is being considered for legislation here in the state of Florida that will no longer allow any sort of uh, treatment? hour? Any sort of gender affirming care for... Any, anybody under the age of 18. So if you are under the age of 18, you will potentially be denied any treatment um, for gender dysphoria. So no puberty blockers, no, no anything, no nothing. Um, I and as an educator, see, this is uh, this topic is, is it's heavy because when you look at it as an educator, um, I don't know the answer sometimes. Like I, this is one of the ones I'm, I just don't have answers for. When they mean gender affirming care, this is where it pisses me off because this is it's different when you, to me, it's different when you're going medically versus, you know, doing the therapy for it. They're they're actually denying therapy. Yeah. And that's that's just so many levels of effed up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not even right. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how I feel about medically uh, giving a, a teenager, unfortunately, the right to make a decision like that, because I don't know if you're have the brain to do it yet, but that's more of a of a developmental kind of question right. for me rather than an ethical question. It's more of like, I don't know if you have the decision making skill at this point to be making something, a decision about your body that's long term. It's like a tattoo. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. And with 
you know, with things like puberty blockers, um, there the moment you stop taking them, everything kicks back in the way that it's supposed to. Right. So I'm okay with somebody who's like, I don't know if I'm okay, but I would much rather have somebody delay puberty and be more androgynous until they do have that development and they have that that support and that knowledge and the the ability to make that decision for themselves as opposed to having dead kids because that's what we have and you know the other part of go ahead stace i think there's a bigger like this leads into a bigger issue with medical everything um and making decisions for people because as a woman i can't get a hysterectomy without my husband's permission right right like even if it's medically necessary and my doctor says you need to do this because you know you're gonna bleed to death whatever it is he has to sign off on it that's fucked for up. For me to get a yeah, hysterectomy. Now, yeah, it's really, it's, is, it, is this is still, also. I'm sorry. Is that still plausible if you're single? Or? Yeah. Oh, no. If you're single, it is infinitely harder. Yeah. And they have an, age. Yeah, so you, so they have an age limit. Like you cannot, you cannot have like any kind of sterilization, tech, like any procedures before the age of 23. Here it's 35. Yeah, and that is really? ridiculous. That yeah. can vary state yeah. by state. And um, yep. but for any of you guys out there listening, there is a list that you can find about doctors who are friendly to women having bodily autonomy and making the decisions that they want. Uh, you know, a salpingectomy or a hysterectomy or just like I don't ever want to have babies. But you know, if if you only have one child, and let's just say that you know I woke up one day and I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm 41, right? I could still technically have a kid. God forbid. <laughs> but if I, but if I, if I woke up and I was like, you know what, I think I want to, I'm going to enter, you know, I, I want to get a hysterectomy because I never want to have children. My doctor could look at me and be like, well, you only have one child. And even though you, you know, primarily date women, what happens if you marry a man? And what happens if that man wants to have children? Well, I don't know. Marry somebody with a working uterus, dude. Like it ain't me. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it, you know, and this is, this is interesting. This, this conversation is so interesting to me because at 17, I had my right ovary removed because I had stage two cancer, ovarian cancer. And they asked me before I, I went in, they were like, um, you know, if we have to do a full hysterectomy, can we? And they were like, we will we'll make sure we don't. I'm like, honestly, you could take it all out now. Like, cause I knew at that age that I didn't want to, I didn't want to have kids. And they were like, absolutely not. <laughs> like we are not doing that. I could not have made that decision at 17. Right. And I don't know if. You can make a gender decision at that age either. I'm not sure. Like, this is where I think a lot of research needs to be done. Because Mm -hmm. at 17, I mean, I knew at 17 what I wanted. And it honestly, I have my kid and I'm happy I have my kid. But would I have made the same decision? Yes, I would have made the same decision because I didn't want to have kids. And I knew that, like, go, you know, at 17. So it's interesting, right? Like, at 17, I wasn't able to make that decision. Mm hmm. No, and you know, we, we still aren't allowed to make those decisions. No. Like we, we And we were I mean, and neither is Stacy at 35. <laughs> no. Yeah. Without Justin's permission, because in a lot of ways, but that's like we were talking about with medical things. So, you know, I I am all in for the idea of things that would do something like delay puberty or in the absence of you know, any sort of medical intervention, um, to have things like chest binders that are accessible so that there's less gender and safe, dysphoria. right? Like making sure it's done safely. Cause that's one of the big things about chest binding is it can be dangerous. And if you just let, I mean, it's like let kids do anything the wrong way. It's going to be dangerous. Like at least give them the right way to do it. As, as, yeah. I, know, as I know teens. <laughs> and they're going to find know? a way anyway. They're going to find exactly. a way. Exactly. Anyway. Might as well show them the right way. Yeah. They'll ace bandage those boobs right on down and cause like massive problems. Right. And I think giving them, you know, therapy options, someone to talk to, an an impartial person who's not going to tell them what they need to do or whatever. I mean, that's big for a child that's trying to figure out who they are. And And that's where, you know, for a lot of kids. How dare you take away the therapy out of it? Like, how dare you? That's such bullshit. Yeah, that's not that's not okay Because, you know, some of those kids, um, you know, I taught a kid who mom was supportive. Dad told her she was going to hell. I mean, that's just how it went. And I mean, I'm sorry, if, if you're telling your kid they're going to hell, there's a problem with you. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have to agree with their choice, but don't be like that. Right. Um, you know, they're your child. But let's let's but, talk about the fact that they're taking it a step further here, Stace. There is a in conjunction with this potentially a law that says, let's say that I get remarried. OK, let's say that that yeah. happens. Let's say that the person I marry has a child because they're not forcing people to detransition. So if somebody's already on puberty blockers, they can maintain that their grandfathered in. That being said, 
if the person that I were to be in a relationship with had a transgender child or were transgender themselves, my ex could take emergency custody of my child if they said that it was against their beliefs. It would allow the non-custodial parent to take emergency full custody because there was somebody in the household that was transgender or undergoing a, a gender transition. It is they are looking to codify that into law. And it and I, is terrifying. That is, that is disgusting is what it is. I mean, I I just don't understand why they're so obsessed with this. I mean, there are a lot more cohesive and, you know, well, uh, just more healthy families that have same sex, uh, like same sex parents or like transgender parents. I want to hear something. Chris, I want to hear something funny. Yeah. Did you know the (laughs) the chances of you being LGBTQ and your parents are same sex? You have less of a chance. Of being that. I've heard <laughs> like that. You're, you're I've actually heard that. Kind of more likely to be straight. So, <laughs> so the whole thing about, I, I mean, I don't know why they're so, bullshit. what they're co- so concerned about, because they're already, they're banning drag. They're trying to ban books that show same sex uh, animals, for God's sake. Um, it's just like, what do you think will happen if they actually read these books or see these people wearing drag? Do you think that they're going to catch some sort of gay virus or some shit? Well, I mean, I what I grew up in a very like heteronormative society and I'm queer as fuck, y'all. Like, <laughs> yeah. it does not matter how many books I read with straight love stories. Like, I still like girls. So, I mean, it it, it isn't that it's it's just that yeah, I think right now it's they don't very, like it. Well, I mean, it's a, they, it's an easy hot button topic. And right now with the political division that we have, the LGBT community uh, and religion and, you know, take our country back and this is supposed to be under God. It's a tool of division and it's an easy oh. thing for people to rally behind because it is so public. <clears throat> um, and, mm-hmm. you know, drag queens are flamboyant and they are, you know, loud and it's the gay scene can get pretty raucous. Like there's a couple of pride events that I will take my kid to. There are several pride events that are definitely not child appropriate, but they will let you know very upfront. These are not family friendly. These ones are just like they're we can. I, Sam, we can take my kid to Hop Life and to Pierced and to Walking Tree, but we sure as hell can't take my kid to Pip Shows. Like we're right, right. we're not we're not doing that. Right. There are adult spaces and there are child spaces, and it's not right. the presence. I, I saw a meme the other day that was like, um, "Pedophile rings are busting." You know, our fathers, our church members, they're busting. You know, politicians, but they're not busting drag queens. So how does that? I make saw sense? the same one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like how many how many drag queens do you know who got busted? None. Like they mm-hmm. if we look at the system as it is, okay. You know, we're so worried about having a kid in a house with with um, you know someone who's who's gay or who's transgender. Why are we not worried about kids in houses with abusive parents, mm-hmm. with parents who are drinking all the time and aren't taking care of them why are we not worried about those things because those are actually harmful to that child well we are but it's it's not something that society as a whole can point a finger and say we're going to fix this because it's a deeper systemic issue and we don't want to treat the deep systemic issue we want to do what we can do that we can say here look we eradicated the gays quote end quote but (laughs) well and then you get this this emergence in united states culture that has you know that the, I'm sorry, this is where we're going to get real, like, religious political. But the church, as a, as a whole in the United States, has, act, has like, declared that people are, are warring on them. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think it's no. just another soundbite that, you know, it's, makes it easy well, to talk to, 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 for division, right? Like, it, that polarization. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not about that. Like, well, if is- you even look at basic religious tenets, like, love each other, like, first and foremost, this... It, there is no but with that, right? It's like, love right. each other, but don't love the gays. Love each other, but don't love trans people. That's not how this works. <laughs> Anyways, go ahead, mm-hmm. Chris. Sorry. I'm gonna oh, well, I was just going to say that it's... Well, first off about uh, the whole religious thing. I mean, people are becoming more and more secular as time moves on. A lot of people yeah. are moving away from religion and just, you know... I don't know. They just uh, Religion just isn't as popular as it once was. So I guess they're trying to claim that there's a war out on them because they're not as popular as they used to be. Well, and that goes um, hand in hand though with like banning books and wanting less education because people well, that, that are less exactly. educated are easier to control. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. And when it comes to uh, that kind of thing, too, uh, uh, shoot, <laughs> I, I I was going and I lost it. Sorry. Like I went off the rails. Jumped oh, its yeah. tracks. <laughs> jumped its tracks. Oh, but we shit. And, and speaking of the, the link here, right, because this was the other thing that I wanted to touch on surrounding this particular topic and, you know, drag and transgender and Stonewall and everything. N- none of these things were a thing until a lot of times the white Christians colonized. If there is a map um, that is on PBS dot org, Sam, and it is a map of world gender customs. And you can pull it up and you can click on this map because realistically speaking, we're the ones who have decided that gender is binary in multiple other societies all across the world. Gender expression is basically limitless. I've actually heard of this when I was over in Korea. Um, I was actually talking with a friend from New Zealand. We I was visiting him over there and. He was telling me that there's actually like a third gender over in Korea. Yes. Uh, and it's and it's like this. Uh, it's like a woman who's like beyond her beyond her prime, I guess you could say. She's just, <laughs> she's just uh, kind of like the grandma of like, uh, like she's not just someone's grandma. She's everybody's grandma and everybody treats her like that. And that's kind of like their third gender in a way. And I and I thought that was really interesting, you know. Well, like, so in Mexico, there's a third gender called the Mujé. And the Mujé in Mexico are, you know, neither necessarily male or female. They are designated a third gender. In India, you can have a third gender and and be designated that on your driver's license, that you are not one of the other. Um, In Hawaii, before colonization, uh, there were a third gender there that they were called, let me take a look here. They, they're the Mahu. They could be biological male or female, but encompass a gender somewhere in between anywhere of that on the spectrum. In Native Americans, sometimes they were called being two spirited. You weren't necessarily one or the other. You could do both or express yourself however you wanted to. Um, and one that I found really interesting, especially when we want to talk about like, uh, gender as a social construct versus gender as a biological construct, right? Like your sex is your sex. You either have testes and ovaries or you have a uterus or a peanut. Like we, that's a biological sex, right? Gender is the expression of that sex. And that is something that we just as a whole just woke up one day. Well, I mean, we didn't, but we created these very narrowly defined gender norms based on societal expectations, but the, and they have changed over time. Yeah, which well, is yeah. real interesting. It's, like especially in like the toy, like the toy owls too. Like you know, they didn't Colors, used to be like boys, toys. and it didn't used to be like uh, boys and girls toys, and, or blue and pink. That was all decided because toy companies wanted to make more money, and so they had to decide. You know, well, and, and I, I, I think that even the uh, going back to your saying, Grace, the the infant i know there's something like 60 labels now you know of of what you identify in terms of gender and i get it because you know what like if i could you know anecdotally like nail this it's that when i was growing up like i really liked and stace i know you had the same thing i love tech i loved all these guy guy things quote unquote Mm -hmm. that it was like being it was awkward like i i identify as a female like i'm cisgendered i'm but i have all these masculine qualities about me and how do you reconcile that growing up where that's not standard right and and how do you make that okay if i had a label for that back you know when i was a high schooler it is so much easier (laughs) to be honest with you i think i think our society is so stuck on what is normal why do we need normal why why do we need this because Because it's the fucking puritans yeah, well, it's just a setting on the washer. Isn't that the the quote? <laughs> Basically, and <laughs> it, it just needs to go. Like the the whole concept of normal needs to go away mm-hmm. because it you know everything changes constantly. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah, and, instead of you know, focusing on normal. To, yeah, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Trying to stick to that, you should be normal. No, that 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 doesn't work because we're not all the same person. We all have our own identities, and that's how it's supposed to be. So. <laughs> Go away with the normal. Make it go bye bye. We don't mm-hmm. need it. Yeah, instead of focusing on being normal, we need to focus on being happy. You know, yes, and, and healthy with ourselves. You know, and minding your own damn business if it has nothing to do with you. 
<laughs> Damn yes, straight. Let people live their lives. Let people live their lives and move on. It's, it's well, I mean, so simple. Right? But they, this is not a. This is not hurting anybody, guys. Like what people, I identify as has nothing to do with you. Well, yeah. people like to talk about it, it that it is a biological thing, right? That like you're either. I, biologically male or biologically female but that is not true human genetics are so fucking weird when you get right down to brass tacks human genetics are just weird and the way that that xx xy you know you can have a fractured x chromosome you can have you could end up with both testes and yeah you can have xxy you can have more x's and y's than you were supposed to yeah you can have xxy but hormonal imbalances yeah i mean there's a ton of shit well (laughs) but and and that's why i kind of like i wanted to pull the map up and you know discuss a little bit because this is really fascinating you can click on each of these and when you click on it it pulls up the the different gender expectations in that area and what they are but the one that i want to talk about before we end this is specifically the dominican republic so on that tiny island, genetics has created a third sex, like a legitimate, heritable third oh. sex. Huh. Wow. With um, <clears throat> undifferentiated genitalia. So there's a pseudo hermaphroditic trait discovered in the 1970s. So typically these children begin to be raised as girls, but may or may not develop male secondary sex characteristics when they hit puberty so instead of changing their gender identity they just live as a third gender called gueva doce which translates basically into testicles at 12 because that's when that secondary sex characteristic develops and because this is so prevalent on that island there is legitimately a third gender that has distinct roles in the society that are the Gueva Doce. So it's wow. not just about your emotional expression. There is a heritable trait and these, these people have full lives and can reproduce that like, so is it that easy? Is it that easy that like you're biologically male or biologically female? Cause we're not, we either identify as cisgendered. Like I've, I've never in my life felt like I was anything other than a girl. I haven't. But I have lots of of friends who do. And I was that girl that wore frilly ass dresses and patent leather shoes and stomped in mud puddles and climbed trees and ruined things. And I drove my mother insane. Um, (laughs) But I've never struggled with that identity for myself. And that's probably because I was raised in a household where it didn't matter if I wanted to play with G.I. Joe's, I could. If I wanted to play with Barbies, that was cool, too. But this forced gender expression is solely a Western thing. And if you just look at that map. Like as a whole, societies around the world who do not require gender expression in the manner that Western Christian civilization needed them to do it. So this we have regressed what had previously been a, you know what, if you're two spirited, that's cool. You you Mm -hmm. that's where you function best. Go for it. And I would love to see more of that. I would love to see more of just that acceptance, because really, at the end of the day, I don't. I don't want somebody to feel like the accepted definition of who they're supposed to be is a reason for them to no longer want to exist. And that's the thing that gets me about the LGBTQIA plus community is the higher rate of suicides. And we're going to get real deep here for a second because it is such a major thing. It is such a major thing. I don't want to see any dead kids because the adults in their lives failed to accept them because they didn't have a safe space in a teacher like Stacy or Chris or Sam that was willing to say, you know what, maybe you're struggling, but I love you and it doesn't matter. And that's what some of this legislation is doing. We're telling them as a society that they are wrong, that they are wrong for existing and they're not wrong. We are doing it wrong. So we got to do better. We adults have to do better. And, and I want to, can I throw this out as like a person who I have um, <clears throat> quite a few just uh, just different gender people in my life <laughs> you know than than what their biological gender is and they're they're pretty uh, not well, not pretty they're freaking awesome um ask I, I think it's good to ask questions if you don't understand or go find resources to understand and to to interact with people because i think um it feels overwhelming for people who don't understand this don't understand and then maybe you do have a kid who is coming out as trans and you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, that is okay. Go find a resource to get through it. Like there are resources out there that are amazing. And it's okay that you don't have all the answers. Cause yeah, that's use not the Google. 
Yeah, your job is not to have all the answers. Like your job is to listen and to be tolerant and to go find the answers in good resources. Yeah. And and don't just assume that your your friend that is trans or the acquaintance that you had from high school that that is trans or a member of the LGBTQ community wants to do that emotional labor for you. Because quite frankly, sometimes I am so fucking tired of having to educate people that don't know me about how I have a baby and what it was like to get married. Like sometimes I get very tired of it, you know, and, and my soon to be ex and I were pretty, you know, we, we were trailblazers. We were the first same sex couple in the state of West Virginia to have a child um, after the laws were changed federally in 2015. So 2014. Yeah. October of 2014. I had just gotten pregnant. So we were the first and I, my kid's birth certificate was a traumatic event just to get a birth certificate because the paperwork said mother, father, right. And they wouldn't let us fill it out because it was mother and mother. And it took three weeks and me being like postpartum crazy lady for me to get them to issue a birth certificate. I was like, I can't put my kid on my insurance. Like he doesn't exist right now because you won't give me a birth certificate. So we're the reason that they changed to say parent one, parent two, because I lost my damn shit and knew the right people to call. But not everybody, you know, I still get tired of it. Like for people to oh, well, ask not everyone's me, in the right place to do that. So yeah, let me yeah. take that back. Make sure, you know, ask questions to those who feel comfortable that you know are, are open. Ask and people them will if they're say, comfortable. Yeah. Right. And you'll know, like um, Stacey and I, I'm always open to uh, questions with kids with autism just because that's I I want to talk about it and I want people to know. But sometimes I don't have the mental space for that. Like this week, I would not have the mental space for that. (laughs) I'm sick. (laughs) But, you know, utilize resources. And Grace, um, go ahead and collect some resources to throw into show notes if you guys know some just good ones to throw in show notes. And one thing I'll say too, um, you know, I had a lot of students who went by different names than their biological name. And it was usually like the middle of the school year, they would decide to change it. And I would tell them, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to really try to call you by the name you want. If I mess it up, if I dead name you, correct me, correct me as soon as I do it. And I will get it because I'm really bad with names. I'm horrible with names. And I mean, I, I knew in my head, this is, this is the name they're going by. This is the name I need to call them. I would still screw it up sometimes. And they were always so nice about it to me. They were so kind. And I always felt so bad. I'm like, I'm sorry. I did not mean to dead name you. Like, I'm really trying. Because I had several of them in one class. Like, they were, it was a lot of my GT kids. And um, they were all in the same room. And they would correct me. They would. And I wanted them to do that. I'm like, if I if I use the wrong pronouns, if I use the wrong name, stop me. Like, and make me fix it. And then you get yeah. a challenge in school yeah. where uh, you have to know who knows. Yeah. I had that mm-hmm. a, a few instances of that where I, I knew but their mm-hmm. parents didn't know. Certain teachers didn't know. Mm-hmm. You had to be careful yes. about who knew, who didn't. And yeah. that's the kind of culture, like if you're let, you know what I mean? Like that happens where kids can't even let you know what they want to be called because you're not being accepting. And I mean, come on, people. Yeah, because some of the teachers are like, I'm not calling them by that name. And I'm like, why? I mean, if this kid's going by their middle <laughs> name, you call them their middle name. How right, is you, if they difference? want a nickname, you call them by, what is the difference? Listen, yeah, I'll call it, anybody I mean, whatever the hell they want. Chris, you want to be called... Uh, purple dinosaur for the next six months i'm done got it buddy i'm gonna be called chris sensei Mm. (laughs) (laughs) it's not gonna happen is it but i'll do it i'll do it but But can i call you purple dinosaur because i kind of want to do that fine (laughs) fine (laughs) but i think for me it was just being open like i'm not doing this on purpose i'm just really horrible with names and i'm so used to calling you what i was calling you right so Correct me when I do it wrong. Like, also, it's hard because you're calling a te- like what you the name you see on attendance is different. Than- <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, like, and I did it on my computer. So like when I did it on paper, I had it on my notes, like what I was supposed to call them. But um, you know, when I'm just doing you it from my computer, I don't. Yeah, but just you saying that though, I'm sure just realizes that you actually care enough to actually validate that they are going through something and they actually want to identify something else. They yeah. need that. Yeah. Kids need that kind of validation. Affirmation and. Uh, and going through what we're going through now, and especially in fucking Florida, with the whole—I um, I know we're going over, but I'll, I'll try and. Make it's, this okay, quick. it's okay. It's but okay. Like, but like the whole thing about like certain books being banned, and uh, especially like ones that have same-sex couples in them, like a, a same-sex coupled penguin yeah. book. Fucking a man, uh, I, I, that just threw me for a loop. But um, 
but they're actually banning that kind of thing. And you can't say gay uh, before third grade or something like that. And I'm like, well, what if a child actually has same sex parents? How are we going to How is legitimize them in our class? How are we going to make them feel like they're accepted in our classroom? But we can't even talk about that kind of thing, especially even if they ask about it. Yeah. And you know something? You know? The, 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 the thing that cracks me up about this is that most teachers that I know are like, <laughs> and they're not, they don't even care. They're like, go ahead and make it a law. We're not going to pay yeah. attention because we're teachers and that's not what we hmm. do. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a pendulum swing. You know, it, it is swinging back. But the reality is, is that, you know, gay people, transgender people, non-binary people, people have always been people. Humans going to human, right? Sometimes yeah. in, in terrible ways, but also sometimes in really beautiful ways. I mean, let's look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? The Epic of Gilgamesh, historically, I mean, they're lovers. This is a love story in a lot of ways with Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Like, I, it's always existed, and we've only made it a problem in the last, you know, several hundred years, really, since Christianity and and the massive colonialization of the world. So let's let's not. But at, at the end of the day, you know, all of these things, you know, the, the few topics that we've touched on here and you know, some of this, this is just the tip of the iceberg for people. And I want for people to remember, like, we're the things that we do. The things that we say, the way that we are treating our families and our neighbors, it impacts them. And sometimes all it takes is one person saying, I see you and I hear you. I see you and I hear you and you're valid and you're worthy to change somebody's life for the better. So, guys, if you have those people in your lives, if you have family members, if you've got kids in your lives, if you've got adults in your lives that are transitioning at 65 or that one day come out of the closet and realize that they've been living a lie and they have been in love with their business partner for the last 40 years, you don't got to get it, okay? There's a lot of stuff out there that I don't get. There's a lot of don't it. Don't have to get it. It has exactly. nothing to do with you. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's a, your business. Yeah, there's a lot of things out there that I don't get. But you know what? Kindness costs me absolutely nothing. It costs me nothing to be kind. As long as we are not hurting each other or hurting ourselves, your kindness and support costs you nothing. And if it uh, if if that support is costing you a piece of your moral or, or ethical values before you throw that out there, take a look at it and see what it is about it that feels so intimidating for you. Take a look at that because your refusal to support could be the difference between somebody who is here and somebody who isn't. So at the end of the day, y'all just be fucking nice to each other. And we've been doing this for years. We're here. We're queer. Get over it. Well said. Be nice. Ask kind. yourself this question. Would you want someone telling you how to live your life? Because I yeah. promise you those people that are telling others how to live their life would not respond the same. If someone That's tried to so true. Well, my, exactly. My statement on that has always been like my rights end where somebody else's begin. Right. I mm -hmm. should have the right to marry whoever the hell I want to. I don't have the right to force Sam into performing that marriage because then I'm trampling on her individual freedoms. And I can respect that. I have the right to be angry. I don't have the right to punch Stacy in the face because I'm pissed. Your rights, right. All, right. your rights end where mine begin. And that is and just the end of it. American ideology. Yeah. Okay, you know, people, can I get on my liberty like box for just like two seconds? Go for it. The definition of liberty. Okay. Which is something you say in the stinking Pledge of Allegiance kids every day. <laughs> I used to tell my students this. You, you say this word liberty, it means like, as long as I am not hurting anyone else, I can do what I, I can do what I want. Like, and are you hurting anyone else? Is it, it is, is the person who's transitioning hurting you? No, no, it's all you. about love. It's all about loving other people and loving yourself. And they are putting, trying to put a ban on that stuff. And like, it's like the most American idea is liberty. And you're, you know, I don't know, just it, 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 it makes me mad because the political end of this is like, they're using like American ethical values as an argument to this? No, it's not. It's not an argument. It's like literally the opposite. I digress. This is my political <laughs> side coming out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I did not get on my soapbox that much. I'm really proud yeah. of myself. Hey, you, no, you did good. that to a really short period. I'm proud of you. You did good. Sam. I mean, and, good. and June is typically pride month. So, I mean, I'm sure we can revisit some, some different facets of this because it is a big piece of where we are as a society right now. And I think that it's important, you know, for the five of y'all out there that routinely listen to us to um, take a moment and, you know, just understand that, Chris, your eyes got real big. There's more than five. There, 
<laughs> he was worried. He's like, there's only five of them? But the, I'm like, no, you there's know, more. You know what I'm saying. But like, you know, for, for those that are out there listening to us ramble for an hour or so, this, it is a big deal. And like we've talked about before, uh, when we discussed hidden figures and bathroom segregation, these things don't matter until there's somebody in your life that it matters to. Um, because otherwise it doesn't affect you. It doesn't touch on you and you don't understand how deep seated some of these things go, you know, and we've got a long and gross history in the United States of making shit ass decisions surrounding some of this. So uh, my parting thought on that is even if this doesn't affect you yet, it does. They just haven't come out to you yet. There is somebody in your life that you love that fits under this umbrella. There is. And maybe not coming out to you because you're not very accepting. Yeah. So there so, you are for that. <laughs> so it, it does affect you. It does affect you. You know, black rights are human rights. Trans rights are human rights. Gay rights are human rights. Women's rights are human rights. Let's just be kinder to one another. It's a, it's a big world. There's a lot of beauty out there. Don't be part of the ugly. Exactly. Yes. Orange, Orange right, kind of proves this message. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> I would vote for Orange Cat. <laughs> Orange Cat has been in the, the the way the entire time <laughs> he has just been i don't know if y'all see him but <laughs> i took a picture because oh, yeah. you guys can't see it but like he's in like literally like on top of the keyboard <laughs> <laughs> i love it awesome well ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for listening this is a very passionate one for us and we hope that you enjoyed it and maybe learned a few things as well um, as always, don't forget to check us out uh, wherever you get your podcast, whether that, is, that, that be Spotify, Amazon Music, um, uh, Stitcher, I don't know, whatever other ones there are. And check out our Facebook page. Stacy always puts up some of her awesome uh, recipes for coffee on there. And we also like to just put up some random stuff every now and then. And our, but, our Instagram and Facebook group are tagged in show notes all every time. So exactly. Oh, us. and. And also uh, check us out on Untapped as well. Please friend me. I believe uh, I'll have to, I have to remember my tag. I think it's Chris Sensei one nine eight nine or something like that. Check it out and um, stay beside it, my friends. Beside again.